What's going on? Positive energy. Vital is vital. Honeycrisp apples. I think they're the best. I gotta take this to a jeweler, have him hook it up for me. Put me a new bezel on there. Get a nice big chain. Line of Judah. Yeah, I gotta get a big chain for this. So. I had to have the internet company reset my modem for some reason. I couldn't get over here. I hope y'all doing all right. When you get a chance, go to Whole Foods, get some of these tea tree toothpicks. These are good. Disinfect it so you don't get the flu, pneumonia, or COVID-19. All right. So, yeah, my brother called me up. He said, hey, it's a coronation. So, last year I had brethren. I said, yeah, brethren Rastafari all the time. He said, you getting ready to go on YouTube? You going to talk about it? I was like, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so, we'll talk about it. I usually don't talk about Holly Selassie that much. Because it's personal and YouTube is a little weird. Black people on, on the YouTube are a little emotional and a little bit kind of weird. So I just avoid certain conversations. We got so many weirdos on the internet. You attract that type of people. Anytime you talk about anything you think about or anything you're into, you find, you attract people that got to go out their way to say, oh, no, I'm not. You know, it's just really, really strange. I see all type of videos. I don't go on people's videos to express opposition to whatever they're saying gets a little nutty. So I'll talk about it, but the comments will be off. I didn't read all the weirdo comments. Too many weirdo comments. Too many emotional people. So yeah, the day is a coordination at Brahali Selassie. Really big day, a very important day. And out of respect to his majesty, I'll talk about it. Uh, my video about Ethiopia, that video is, uh, private. 
So that video is private. I make a lot of the videos private after a while. Depending on what I say, sometimes uh, when I'm talking to people, I keep it really real. And some of the stuff that I be telling y'all, uh, I can't leave it up long term. There's little pieces I say that I could get flagged for. If you got people that don't like you, they'll go scroll through all your videos to look for something you said to report it. It's a real strange on on, on, uh, on social media. It's a real a bunch of nuts, you know. So that video will be on Patreon. If you want to see all the banned stuff, you got to go to Patreon. Stuff that will get banned over here. I've even had YouTube block videos that wasn't even available to be seen. I had to say, hey, this video is not even public. They're like, oh, sorry. Yeah, well, can't nobody even see it. What the hell are you blocking it for? It's crazy, like. Unbelievably crazy. So yes, coronation. So I'm going to talk about that. Me as a black man, adults born in America. A lot of people wonder, well, how did you become a Rasta? So we'll talk about that too. Who's over here? Uh, Jira, V.Y., Arnell, Goshen, Swoops, Carlos, Arnell, Tyler, Lady Lioness. I love that name, Lady Lioness. Boy, that's a cold name. Cruz, Mr. Cruz is over here. Chanel, Carlos, Greg, Amos, more power. Yeah, so Emperor Ali Selassie, uh, yeah, Russ, all the time. James McBride, big brother. Uh, Emperor Ali Selassie is very interesting to me. Has a lot to do with my dealing with the timeline of what's going on. It was a very important, like his coronation and his position was a very important mark in history to get an idea where we're at historically in terms of revelations and things like that. It was a very important moment. Uh, We're gonna get into the coronation and all that. I guess I'll get my back brown, uh, background first and uh, how I got into it. Then we'll talk about the whole situation with Harvey Selassie. We'll talk about how Rasta got started in the whole nine yards. Now for me, uh, I came into consciousness as an Egyptian, comedic. So as I came into this as a comedic brother. Uh, we used to have, you know, reading the Piper of Savani and looking at all the brothers with their dreadlocks and Kemet and uh, dealing with all the brethren and Kemet. My first teacher was Ross Pita, was, uh, you know, Pharaoh Pita. And Pita uh, Pita was uh, or is a comedic roster man, a Elaton, and that's why I'm an Elaton. So this elder, I was around him and came into this on their whole comedic 
vegan dreadlock beginning. So the Comedic Brothers I come up under was had the dreadlocks, their long natural hair. They was into all the studies of Kemet, the symbol of life, and all the studies of ancient Kemet. So I came in like that, and that's how I came into consciousness. And uh, that's why my name is Pharaoh. So we were studying Kemet at the time, and the, you read the Pipers of Ani, you see the brothers with their hands up at the suns, with their dreadlocks. You see the brothers from light skin, the darker, the darker, the darker. And so studying Kemet, I come up as a comedic spaceman, uh, studying under Sun Ra, and with my first guru, first elder, in consciousness, Pita, if you go watch my video, uh, Elder's Observation, if you watch that playlist, you'll see my first teacher over there. I'm gonna interview him again when all this is over. He's kind of older, so I don't wanna go around him. So when this is over, I'll go. So I kind of pause those because I'm interviewing a lot of older people. I don't wanna put them at risk. And so I was a young comedic brother. Uh, started changing the way I was eating. And finally got to the point I was a vegan. So I'm a vegan comedic rasta. Comedic. I'm not a. I don't know I'm a rasta. I'm just comedic with my dreadlocks, and taking all type of discrimination. This is 1979, and we. Comedic brothers, and we got our dreadlocks, and black people is laughing at us, and black people looking at us crazy. Uh, it was, uh, you had to be strong. Your relatives don't know why you're not eating meat. They want to know why you letting your hair grow like this. What is that on your head? You know, this was 1979. What is that on your head? What is that? You know, right now it's hard for you all to comprehend because you know so much. But back then, there was no Malcolm X movie. So if you didn't read Malcolm X Speaks, you don't know nothing. And nobody had dreadlocks. So nobody knew what dreadlocks were, including me. I didn't know what dreadlocks were. So I'm growing my dreadlocks. And uh, I got my dreadlocks. It's like 1979, 80. I got my dreadlocks for a little while. And uh, I'm into Egypt heavy. I'm studying everything about Egypt. I'm studying everything about the pharaohs. I'm going to see Dick Gregory doing lectures. So that's putting me up on eating right. So I'm eating right, I'm a vegan, I'm young. I still got a slave name though, but I'm using a, a Egyptian name. My name was a Kenaton at first. So my name's a Kenaton, I'm young, just like y'all are now. Some of y'all young ones, you know, you're finding your way. So I'm finding my way into a whole new mentality uh, black people really did and say they were from Africa and all that. Now, let's rewind. Before I got my dreadlocks and all that, uh, what first really sparked everything was Roots. When Ro A lot of black people don't know this. When Roots came out, Roots were the first introduction to Addos, or to African Americans, that we was from Africa. And that is a fact. There was hints of Africa, because we had the Afro when I was in grade school. So we had the Afro, and you had Soul Train, they like, Wantu Wazuri, use Afro Sheen. 
So it, it was hints of we were African, but the black power movement predominantly pushed black pride, not so much African pride, but black pride, being proud to be black, being proud of your natural hair, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. This was a big move in the 60s. A lot of Moors don't like the fact we call ourselves black, but if it wasn't for the black power movement, the Moors wouldn't even have no recruits because there would not even be any energy out there to even look for a higher consciousness. Everybody would have perms and stuff like that. So the fact they even got somebody with either any type of consciousness to even check for the Moors is still owed to the black power movement because nobody really was dealing with Noble Drew Ali like that. He was pretty much unheard of unless you got in the right circle. We didn't have social media. So if you didn't get lucky to get into the right circle or run into the right brother, you know, knowledge was just not there in the late 70s. It wasn't there because you couldn't just go to the Internet and find stuff. There is no Google. There is no Internet. There is none of that. Unless you bump into a brother, then there's no way to learn anything. So how everything started for me was Roots. It was like 1976, I think I just got out of high school and Roots came out. That was the first time I seen the experience of slavery and all that. It's the first time I actually got to see that because it wasn't like a movie, it was a series. And this series came on every day. So series became better than movies. That's why the power with 50 Cent is so great because a series it's longer than a movie. A movie might be two hours, but a series, an hour every day. So a series could be seven hours, just a week series. So we finding out we Africans. I'm just a young brother. I don't have no dreadlocks or nothing, but I'm curious. So I want to go get African bracelets and cowrie shells. So I looked in the phone book. I found the African shop. So I went to this African shop to get me some African stuff, you know? But I want to be an African. <laughs> My parents is on that Addo stuff. They like, no, nah, we ain't going back to Africa. We got our blood in the soil. Well, they was right on that too. We got our blood in the soil. We want what we got coming here. I didn't understand that. I was like, ah, oh, no, nah, we from Africa. But they was like, no, we got our blood in the soil. Now I understand what they were saying too. So I go to this African shop and I buy me some little cowrie shells and stuff. And because of roots, it's got my mind spinning. So this African lady, I said, excuse me, miss, I want to ask you a question. How can I find out where I'm from in Africa? And this lady was sent, I went to this lady, most high sent me to this lady because this was like a holy experience. Because this lady said to me, she said, sweetheart, my dear, you can be from wherever you want in Africa. And this is what the sister from Africa told me. And I'm still standing on that. The sister from Africa said, sweetheart, my dear, you can be from wherever you want to be in Africa. I ain't nothing but like 18. So I look up. She's got a map behind her. I'm looking at the map. I don't know nothing about Africa. I'm looking. And out of nowhere, I say, I'm from Egypt. I don't know why, but that's your DNA in there. So on a side note, if you you shouldn't argue with brothers. If you feel like you're a Moor, it's because you ran with the Moorish tribe and a lot of your DNA is Moorish. 
but don't try to force other brothers because other brothers ran with other groups. If you feel like you're a Hebrew, that's because you have a large portion of Hebrew DNA. And that's why you feel like that. But you can't trash the other brothers because if you study, we were in all different areas and we were different. Exhibit A, when they wanted to kill Christ, the Most High sent the angel to tell Mary what? Go hide out in Egypt. So the Hebrews hid in Egypt. Well, how can Shemites hide around Hamites unless they look the same? So they still had to look the same or he wouldn't have been able to hide. So I said, I'm from Egypt. So now I am working at a book factory. I don't think about that anymore. I'm working at a book factory. I meet a brother at the book factory. He wear these big things on his head with some things sewed on it that stick out. And he played music, but he was real cool. So I used to hang around him a lot. And he would be eating granola and stuff and say he didn't eat meat and all that. And I'm only 18. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. And I end up, you know, leaving music college because I started reading Malcolm X Speaks and all that. I got real radical. I got frustrated. I wanted to be blacker. And I just, I got it. I'm finna get an A and I quit. I only had two weeks to go, but I couldn't go no more. They were saying everything was white. Music started in Europe. And I just couldn't take it no more. So I just stopped going. And every day I went to the library and read Malcolm X Speaks. So boom, I'm born. I'm like a baby Fred Hampton when I come out of there. So I end up going to work back at the book factory because I worked at the book factory and then went to a music college. Then I went back to the book factory. And I end up going to work for a stock exchange. So I'm working for this stock exchange. And one day, me and my girlfriend, we want to go bike riding. So I didn't go to work. We went bike riding. And we end up on Bongo Beach on 63rd at the beach. And we got there. And the brothers were playing the bongos. And sisters had shaker rays. And it was like some black culture. Well, I'm not into this yet. But something about us like, ooh. So we stopped on our bikes. And we watching them play the drums. But while I'm there, the brother I went to music college with is at the beach. So I'm like, hey, man, I don't know his name or nothing. I just know him. You know, he's like, hey, brother. I'm like, hey, brother. So he like, I'll be up here all the time. So we there and the drums and stuff is playing. And I had already started to eat a little better, but not really. But I used to always notice these dudes with these dreadlocks, and they was always going in health food stores downtown. I wasn't going to health food store because it looked like, what is that? Like pills. Back then, the health food store had mostly like vitamins and herbs and stuff. They didn't really have no food in the juice bar. And so when I'm out there with the brother standing, a brother across from us came out there with dreadlocks. So I asked the brother, I said, hey, brother, how he get his hair like that? He said, oh, brother, our hair grow like that naturally. All you got to do is wash it, and it'll start spiraling, and it'll pick up the kinetic forces, and it'll turn to ge 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 uh, ge uh, geometrical swirls, and it'll swirl up. You don't have to do nothing. He said, remember how you used to go swimming with your afro and come out, and you could see those little points? He said, that's dreadlocks. I said, do you got to twist them up or whatever? He's like, no, just wash it. Watch it every day. It'll dread up on its own. I said, I want some. So I went home and twisted it up anyway. But I was like, oh, I didn't like that. That was too fast. Because I had a jerry curl. So I washed it back out. I said, I'm going to do it like he said. I'm going to let them grow naturally. So I didn't get a jerry curl no more. I just went straight from a jerry curl and started growing dreadlocks. So I'm going to the beach all the time. I'm growing my dreadlocks. Make a long story short. And I leave the stock exchange and start working at the U.S. Treasury Department, right? So 
I'm working at the U.S. Treasury Department, and there's a health food store because now I'm eating better. Now I'm a vegetarian because the brothers guide me. I'm going around him all the time. He's saying, man, you still got dead bodies in the freezer because I'm eating fish. I'm like, oh, dead bodies. So I stop eating dead bodies. I become a vegan. So now I'm a vegan. I'm eating right, but I'm thinking I'm a vegetarian, but if we really was vegans. We was like vegetarians that didn't eat dairy, which is basically vegans. My name is Akenaton, but I still got my slave name because I didn't change my name until 1981. And this is around 80, this is around 80, going to 81, around the time I'm getting ready to change my name. So I'm calling myself a Kenneton while I try to find a name. So I go in this health food store. I got my little dreadlocks, man. I'm a comedic with my dreadlocks. I go in the health food store and the brother come in with some locks all the way down to his knees. So I go, whoa. I said, hey, brother, how long it take you to get your dress like that? He said, be patient, brother. And he gave me a flyer to go to some type of concert that had a bunch of brothers on there with dreadlocks. Well, at that time, black people was laughing at me with my dreadlocks, right? My hair is wet, I can't sit on the back of his head. So black people was laughing at me with my dreadlocks. So I was longing to be around more people like me. So I see these brothers with all these dreadlocks and bro got some dreadlocks, so I tell my girlfriend, I'm going to see this show. I ain't know nothing about reggae or nothing. So finally, Friday night come, we go to Brother Tim's, get some vegetarian burgers, and then we go to the Hummingbird to see this show on 87. So when I get in the show, it says starts at nine, I get there like quarter to nine, but I ain't know much about reggae because reggae show ain't gonna start till 11. They just saying nine. So when I get there, Nobody's there but two older black people setting the tables and setting everything up. So I walk in with my little dreadlocks. My girlfriend don't have dreadlocks later. She end up with some, though. So I walk in with my dreadlocks, and these two older black people say, Hey, Rasta. So I go, Rasta. I go, oh, hey. And they was all nice and everything, and they act like they knew what my hair was and all that. So I was like, wow, this is the first time somebody been friendly to me with my hair. Because black Americans and black people was real mean to me about my hair. It wasn't like you all think. It was cruel. So it's the first time I feel at home. Like, oh, wow. So we sit there, and the band come for sound checking. Oh, these brothers come in with these long dreads and they start playing. Do, 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 do. They having a soundtrack. They playing Black Hero, but I don't know no Black Hero. I think they playing their song. And they do their sound check, and I'm like, whoa. To see all them brothers with them long ass dreadlocks. And I started noticing they had hats like this with their hair in them. So I said, oh, I've been walking past people with dreadlocks all this time. They got them hid in them hats. I ain't know. So the show started getting crowded. All these dreadlock brothers start coming in there. And they in there smoking weed and shit. And I'm like, oh, oh, because I smoke weed. So I'm like, oh, I got dreadlocks. They got dreadlocks. I smoke weed. They smoke weed. Everybody seem like I'm the shit in here. I, this, I'm normal. So I'm like, wow, I'm normal. So I remember I had to go to the washroom. So when I went in the washroom, it was a bunch of Rastas in there. Shout out to Ross Carl, because Ross Carl was in there. I didn't know him at this time. So I came in, when I walked in, all the Jamaican brothers started Gravitate to me. Hey, brethren, what's the my name? Hey, I, uh, hey, I ain't never felt that before. I'm like, whoa. So they, hey, 
what do I name? I'm like, huh? He's like, what do I name? I'm like, huh? He said, what's your name? I said, oh, my name, Akhenaton. And they go, Akhenaton, the great Egyptian pharaoh from this dynasty. I said, oh, you know this shit? So they knew all the African history, right? So I'm blown away. So the concert was fire, right? It was on a Friday night. So Saturday come, when I get home, I, I got my tickets still in my pocket because I got there so early, they didn't ask me for no tickets. My tickets say Friday night. So I tell my girlfriend, I say, let's go back to the Saturday show because we young kids, we working jobs out of high school. We ain't got no lot of money. I said, let's go back to the Saturday show and give them these tickets. And then when they say something, let's say, we thought it would say Saturday. So we go, it's on the north side this time. They had one on the south side and one on the north side. If you know anything about Rosses in Chicago, you got the south side. Then you got the ones on the north side live from the north side up to Evanston. So they had the show in both spots. So we get to the show. I tell my girlfriend, let me do it. So I go to the thing. I get a lady the tickets. The lady look at the tickets. She said, these from last night. I said, what? I thought they was for the night. She said, hold on. So she goes inside and she comes back with somebody who now is my, one of my eldest teachers, Zadi Wadada I. So Zadi Wadada I come out. This is the brother I met at the health food store. He comes out. He gets the tickets, he looks at the tickets, and he looks at me and my girlfriend. We ain't number 18, you know? We kids, we young. He looks at the tickets, he look at us. He said, let them come in, and they let us in. And boy, I was excited, so I went in there and it was a bigger place. And them brothers tore the show down, right? So I'm in the show, the show rocking and shit, and so I'm sitting there, so this older Rasta, which would be my second guru teacher, shout out to Josh Stone, this Rasta walks up to me and say, Bridget, what's the I name? I said, my name is Kenneth Time, boom, boom, boom. He said, where you live at? I told him where I live. He said, I'm not going to come check you in the morning at 9 o'clock. Just like that. He don't know me from a can of paint. The next day at 9 in the morning, I lived in Rosa. I lived on 115th off of Rosa, right catty corner from that police department. That brother was at my crib, 9 in the morning. So he just come to get me and shit way out. So he just come to get me, and he's like mentoring me. And he finds out I could play music, so he's telling me, did I play trumpet and all that? He said, my young brethren, because he's the oldest, and he lived, his, his, his brothers, they had a band called Nyakoma. So he said, I want you to come and help my brothers and help us with the band since you know music. I was like, okay. So I end up getting my trumpet and going to their house. I'm going to be the trumpet player. So when I get to their house, He's the oldest. The next oldest, Gilly. What up, Gilly? Wherever you at, brother. You know I love you, man. So Gilly was the lead singer. And then you had Dada that played the keyboard. John, rest in peace to John. And the elder, John Stone, my elder, played the, nine, the drums. So I'm there. Gilly show up. But the young brothers ain't there yet. So the young brothers in high school, so they in high school, they young rosters in high school with their dreads and everything, right? So they come and they ready to start practicing. So they come, they start practicing. You know what I mean? They let me hear the music and I'm a trumpet player. So it's like boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, spot, 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 spot. Boom, 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 boom. Spot, 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 spot. Which made us one of the best bands in Chicago because we the only ones that had horn play. Shout out to Bird. Bird was like a black dude in white. He looked like a white dude, but he was black with dreadlocks. He played the sax. So me and him on the sax and the horn shit sounds sweet, right? So 
after practice one day, the little young high school rosters come up to me and said, hey, Bridget, they said, you know about this man? They show me a picture of Haile Selassie. They show me a book. They open a book. They say, you know about this man? You know about the king of kings, the Lord of lords, conquering land of the tribe of Judah, the elect of God and light of the world. They telling me about this man. I said, no, nah, what's his name? He said, Emperor Haile Selassie. I. You know what I'm saying? They tell me, Marcus Garvey. I'm like, who is Marcus Garvey? Because you got to understand, in America, when I was growing up, they didn't teach Marcus Garvey, Haile Selassie, or none of that. All they used to teach was George Washington Carver, Frederick Douglass, uh, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, Booker T. Washington. That's it. They did not teach anything about Marcus Garvey in America, Black History Month. They taught the same things all the time. George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington. All the time. So that when they show me about Marcus Garvey, said Marcus Garvey prophesied, look to the east where a king shall be crowned, for the day of redemption is near. So I said, this man, the king of kings. So I look at him. I look at him. I see this black dude, right? I see this black dude because, you know, they lighten up a lot of his pictures, right? So I see this black dude, right? And I see this black dude. I said, he's the king of kings? So I said, yeah, man. So I go home, right? Now, I'm comedic. I'm almost a master at Kimmich. So I start researching Haile Selassie. As I'm researching Haile Selassie, he got all the artifacts. So I'm looking at him from the Egyptian point of view, from the comedic point of view, I see he got the spear in his hand where say he got the whole world in his hand. I see that. I see he got the Excalibur sword. I see he got the triple crown. So I'm thinking. So I'm at the crib like this. I always looked at myself as blessed because I said I'm blessed because I knew about different parts of the world where black people live worse. I said I'm blessed. I'm born in Chicago, Illinois. I'm born in America, in Illinois, in Chicago, Illinois, in Maple Park, with two parents, and I got, I live a good life. I said, and I used to always think that only the most high could have placed me there. So I started thinking, well, if the most high placed me there, why was this man there? So I started saying, well, why is he the king of kings? Why is not me? Why is not nobody else? Nobody can't make him be born at the right time. You can't make that happen. That got to happen through life. There's no way nobody could make him be born by the right father, the right mother in Ethiopia at the right time to get coronated to be the king of kings. This got to be done through nature. This got to be, this got to be prophecy. He can't make himself be the king of kings. He was just a baby. So I said, this man real. Because he didn't put himself there. So I said, this man is a modern day pharaoh. And then I was suspicious. So that's why I love King of Selassie. Because I said, well, I don't know about no black king. I was offended. Because I'm like, why black people don't know we got a black king of kings? Like, everybody would want to know that. I'm like, I was like, everybody would want to know that. If regardless of his Solomonic lineage, he still had to be born at the right time. If, he, if he's born earlier, it's not happening. If he's born later, it's not happening. He got to be there at the right time or it don't happen. No matter what nobody say, nobody can take that away because you ain't him. See what I'm saying? So right away, I said, well, I ain't him, so he got to be somebody. This is the king of kings. Plus, I said, white people don't want me to know this shit, so this nigga's really the shit because I'm like, why they don't want me to know about this niggas? 
Why, I don't know about this niggas. Why don't I know nothing about it? Right? That's the question. So right away, I was like, yeah, this is who they say it is. Because Marcus Garvey didn't even know. Marcus Garvey said, look to the east where well, black king should be crowned for the day of redemption is near. But High Slash hadn't been crowned yet. So Marcus Garvey prophesied this. And the next thing you know, the man got crowned. Nobody can make that happen. And Rasta just, boom, simultaneous, like spontaneous combustion. Nobody created Rasta. It was all a bunch of prophecies that hit. So I, so I say, this man's a modern-day pharaoh. I had been studying Kemet. I knew that Kemet, we had upper, the crown of Upper Egypt, crown of Lower Egypt. Then we had the double crown. But I noticed this crown was a triple crown. I said, whoa. Okay. So from a, from a spaceman, I knew who it was right away. I said, oh, yeah. That's him. I said, oh, they, they ain't want us to see him, right? Because you got to understand, when he get off the throne, I'm in high school. See, they, don't want, they didn't want us to never see him. They ain't never want black people to know nothing about him. When he came to Chicago, he said, I'm not just the king of Africa. I'm the king of black people all over the world. And the fact he said that in Chicago is deep. Because Chicago just ain't any city. So right away. I said, oh yeah, I'm a comedic roster. Because when I started looking at the scriptures, the scriptures say what? Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch forth her hands unto Jah. And I found out that the priest that crowned him was an Egyptian, was a black Com Coptic Egyptian that came up from Alexandria to crown him. So the, the, so the, the comedic and Ethiopian connection is that. And then I'm going to see Dr. Ben, and Dr. Ben said that Ethiopia was the mother of Kemet. So it all made sense to me that Ethiopia is the mother of Kemet. So this was all natural to me, right? Right? You feel me? So, that was very interesting to me. You understand? Very interesting. So right off the top, now I'm a comedic roster. Because it all made sense, because I'm from Chicago. I'm not really from Jamaica. See what I'm saying? So they Africans born in Jamaica. I'm an African born in America. So now I'm a comedic roster off the top. And I started studying. I started seeing everything. I started seeing the correlation. And I started seeing the prophecies that was prophesied. And I started seeing his position in the prophecy. So I can honestly say, without me under, without me, really checking for his majesty, I wouldn't know what's getting ready to go on right now. Because when the Duke of Gloucester went to visit Emperor Haile Selassie, Emperor Haile Selassie gave him a mysterious gift. And when he took that gift back to England, he opened that gift and he got on the lawn in front of his palace for three days and he ate grass. And on the third day, he got up and he said that he was Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. And that he would return after, queen after the incarnate of Queen Elizabeth I. Which means he said he would return after Queen Elizabeth II, who is the queen now. So through High Selassie, I realized that the Antichrist is coming when this queen died. Without studying that, I wouldn't know nothing. Now, I'm going to show you how powerful the Most High is. Now, 
I ain't tell that story about how I prayed out at the beach for knowledge and all that, but I had got picked personally by the Most High for a mission. And when you get picked, when you're chosen, it ain't nothing to brag about. It's a job. So I was specifically picked, and I don't know why. So I leave Chicago. I go to California. A friend I met here got a brother in Compton, said we could go stay with his, with his brother because I want to go out there because there's more rosters out there. So when I get to Compton, eventually we meet King OG of the King's Chamber. We go to Venice Beach. They say, you should go check out King OG and Amanifu. They lived on Jefferson and Normandy. Now check this out. It's me and my brethren Kepler. We some comedic rosters. We go to Nef uh, Jefferson and Normandy, knock on the door. I'm a Nifu come down, introduce himself, say, let me go get King OG. Guess what they was? They was some comedic rosters. They was some Adults rosters, comedic. They were some Egyptian rosters. Real talk in L.A. So when they met us, they like, whoa. So it was an automatic fit. So I'm also in the King's Chamber. Shout out to OG Amanifu. Rest in peace, Jabria. I'm in Ra and all the brethren. Joel, I see you, Joel. Thanks for all the information you be sending me. So I get stamped, right? So now I'm with them. They said they looking for the top of the pyramid. They said it was in L.A. that one of them rich men got the cornerstone from the pyramid. But I'm still staying with the brother in Compton. So one day standing at the bus stop in Compton, right, a van drives by me and my brethren with two rosters in it. It's a younger roster. It's an older roster. He look at the van at us like that. We standing right here on the bus stop. The van go by us, but the van go two houses down and park. And the roster got out and walked to us and said, Hill Bridger, come. And he lived there. Now, what's the odds that two brothers from Chicago go be in Compton, way before it's the NWA, on the corner, and the elder roster is two houses down from the bus? See, this is all divine. I can't do this. Not just any elder roster, but the second in command to Mortimer Plano, that was the roster that went in the plane with Haile Selassie. So this is Ross Kojo Brown, my third teacher, right? So Ross Kojo Brown take a liking to us. So instead of staying at the other brother's house, I stay with Kojo and OG at the King's Chamber. Now Kojo ain't just any roster, he is like the roster. Him and Mortimer, the ones that taught Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and Michael Rose and them how to play reggae music and help create reggae music. Mortimer wrote Sodoma Sagana and all of that. So when you hear Black Hughes say, and Aya Bingi Kojo is coming over the hill, Kojo is the brother I'm living with. So now, the most had him put me with the foundation of Rastafari, right? right? And what I'm learning from him is just too much. You know what I'm saying? It's get crazy, because this brethren is the one that taught them reggae. So he's showing me letters to Bob Marley from India where they was trying to get Bob Marley to come to sing to Krishna and they was trying to get Bob Marley to come to the Middle East to sing to Allah. And they was trying to, they was trying to stop Bob Marley from singing the Rastafari. And they was trying to get him to sing to them other religions. It was deep. So I'm living with Kojo. I'm like his little student, right? Elder Rasta man, right? And he know all of it. So he didn't have a phone because he didn't have no electricity. He showed he had a big marijuana tree in the back. The first day he took us back there, he took us and said, Bridger, what may I going to do with this here? It's too wide. Police going to see it. Helicopter going to see it, right? So I'm living with him. He's teaching me everything, right? He got two twin sons and a daughter staying there. One of his twin sons, I'm following him on Instagram. So he don't have a phone. It's a phone next door. 
So every time the phone ring, he sent me Ramesses. Because I had changed my name by now. I ain't a kid in town no more. I got my, I, my legal name. Ramesses, go get the phone for me. Because they would call him, call your old phone. He would tell me, go get the phone. And every time I would go to the phone, I'd be like, hello? He said, yeah, who this? I'd be like, this Ramesses, a coach told me, come find out who it is. He's like, this Michael Rose. Then like a week later, it's like, this Jimmy Cliff. It's like, this David Hines, this Peter Tosh, right? I'm like, whoa, right? <laughs> I'm a young comedic roster. These people I'm listening to, you know what I'm saying? And all these people's calling them so. Sometime I would get up in the morning because I got to go some of my instance at reggae shows. I would leave Compton, and he lived in Compton. I tell you the deepest thing, he lived in Compton. The rosters that I came up with in Chicago, they would smoke chalice. They would only smoke chalice with rosters. And you got to take your crown off when you smoke chalice. But Ross Kojo, he was smoking chalice with all the adults and regular African Americans. Never seen nothing like it. So the whole Compton loved him because regular brothers, he would smoke chalice with them. This man was like a god. He was like, he was like, I'm the only roster, me and Mortimer, the only two rosters can walk all over Jamaica. So some mornings, I would get up and I would leave Kojo early in the morning and say, I got to go so I could be at the show. And I would go into town, get my answers and stuff, check with OG and them. Then if the show started like 9, I got to get down there like 7, 7.30 because I set up in front. So I could sell so many incense and buttons. I was selling these buttons and stuff, right? So I got to sell my buttons and I got to sell my stuff. So I got to be there before the show starts so I could sell to the crowd and be there when the show's over. So I would leave Kojo early in the morning. And now it's night. It's 7, 6.30, 7.30. I'm at the show. I'm selling all my stuff. And when everybody go in the show, then I would pack up and go in. And then I would leave before they do the encore so I could be out there so I wouldn't miss a dollar. Almost every time I be in front of the show and everybody get in the show, I start to pack up my stuff. The limousine would pull up and start slowing down when they get by me and stop. And I said, that must be Michael Rose now. But when the window would go down, Kojo would be in there. So <laughs> every show... I go to, when I'm getting ready to go in, the limo come, the window go down, and Kojo, Ramesses, come. And I go, and the band be in the. This was so deep. Only the most I could do this. So the band be in there, me being a hustler, I would give the band my buttons because I made buttons off the band song. So if Black Uhuru come in, I got buttons say Black Uhuru. I got buttons sound, say Black Sounds of Freedom. I got buttons say Guess Who Coming to Dinner and all that. So I would give Puma and Ducky and Michael Rose a button or whoever. And they would give me a free pass. And I would go in the show free. I already made $300. And this is just before the show starts. So they would give me, my brethren, and Sia, because we all lived with them, my woman and my brethren, we lived with them, and her daughter. We had little Isis with us. Isis have her little hair wrap on, and they would give us all tickets, and we would go on the show. And when we would go on the show, and they said, ladies and gentlemen, black you, they run out. Dun, 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 dun. And when they would run out, they'd run out with my badges on. Man, you don't know how much money they blessed me to make when they would run out with my stuff on. They would run out with them badges on. So after the show, everybody want one of them because the band all got them on. Puma got it on, Daughter of Zion. You know what I mean? I was bold too because I wouldn't sell the Daughter of Zion button to nobody but a black woman. Like nobody, no other woman could buy the Daughter of Zion. They'd be like, I want that one. I'd be like, no, nah, you can't buy that one. I was real radical. <laughs> you can buy one of these others. You can't buy. You ain't no Daughter of Zion. You can't buy no Daughter of Zion button. You know, only the queens, only the black queens could buy this baby. 
They say, okay, they buy something else. Yeah, buy something else. You know what I mean? This is for them. And so uh, it was just an experience. You know what I mean? It was just crazy. And at night, I'd be at his house. He would light candles. One time he lit a candle, and he took me in his room, and he pulled out a book. And he opened it, and there was a picture of Christ as a baby. It looked just like Heidi Selassie. So much stuff I learned over there. So it was almost like I was ordained to, to do something that I didn't ask to do. And that's how I know it's real because it became part of my life and too much stuff was happening for it not to all be real. Let me give you an example. When I was in Chicago, what made me want to go to L.A. is that Holly Maskell, Holly Maskell, big up yourself. Him and the Rastafarians came to Chicago in the winter. It was snow everywhere. And snow was up three, four feet. But when he got, when they got to the show, it was packed with Rasta because Chicago Moss was big, you know. So we went to the show and they had some, they had some brochures. And when I went home, I looked at the brochure, I ordered a Rastafarian shirt. The name of the group was called the Rastafarians. Hold on. Let's make it good. Let's make it, let's make it good, right? That's what we're here for, right? Hold on. Let's make it. Let's keep it really real so nobody don't think, so you can't say nothing, right? Hold on. Let's keep it going. Hold on, one minute. Hold on, one minute. Oh, man. Don't tell me I put the album in the wrong spot. Oh, man, I put that. That album is in the wrong spot. Can't find it. Hold on. Maybe it's under T. Hold on. Maybe I'll put it under T. Yep. Right here. The Rastafarians. Boy, look at that album cover right there. There go my brethren, Holly, my scale. So this album came out. Boy, this is a classic. This man is a master. He can play bass and sing. So the Rastafarians had, uh, that's the name of the band, the Rastafarians. They had a brochure. So when I went home, I ordered the t-shirt and all that, and they said they lived in California. So I'm like, man, I want to go to California. So I left Chicago. I was getting arrested for weed and shit too much. I ain't even breaking no laws or nothing. So I went to California, and that's how I met Ross Kojo, but peep game. So I end up, the whole plan was to leave Chicago, go to California, leave California, go to Hawaii, leave Hawaii, go to China, India, and East Africa. That was our plan. We wanted to go to Africa, but we wanted to rise in the East. We didn't want to go towards Europe. We wanted to go through the cultural countries to gather, regather the knowledge and come up in East Africa. So the plan was to go to Hawaii, our own island, instead of Jamaica or Trinidad. So when we get to California, we riding on the bus, and one day a brother get on the bus with some dreadlocks, his name's Shay Shay, and he see us and he come to the back, and we're like, hey brother, what's your name? And he was from Kansas City, and he was a roster. But he lived in Hawaii, and he was in California taking care of some business. So we hooked up with Shay Shay. That's how we moved to Hawaii. So I had Shay Shay's number, but a hurricane had came and the house had got messed up because it blew a truck into the house and Shay Shay had to move so I couldn't find her. So instead of my woman and her daughter and my boy going, we set it up where I would go to Hawaii first, get my ticket to go first to find him and get her set up, and then they come seven days later. So I get to Hawaii, 
I'm trying to find the bridge, and the next day I find Shay Shay. I'm on the bus, and I got to change buses. And when I go to get off the back of the bus, Shay Shay get on the front of that same bus. I beat on the window. He see me. I find him. See, this is the most hat. How I'm going to find him in Waikiki? That easy. I would have found him, but the way it happened. And so we start moving all around. So the day come for me to go meet my woman and her daughter and my boy at the airport, the seven days pass. When I get to the airport to meet my boy and his woman, Holly my scale is at the airport at the bit on the big island. This is the big no, this is a Wahoo. We ain't on the big island yet. This on a Wahoo. So Holly my scale is there with his wife going on a vacation. I'm like, what up, Ross? Cause I know them now because I'm playing reggae in LA and all that. I skipped all that part. So now I'm a big mom, he's a big reggae musician, and I'm playing and I know all the rosters, right? But I leave to go to Hawaii. So I run into Holly Mascale. He said, Where am I see this? Why, 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 why? This is my hotel room. Boom, 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 right? Check how powerful the most I is. So Holly Mascale gives me his hotel information and stuff. So me and my brother and this woman, we just get there. I'm going to take them up on the north side, right? To hang out with Ross Clarence. What up, Clarence? And Tony Dredd at Tony Dredd's house with him and his wife. So we get to Tony Dredd's house, and there's this white dude there named Tom Mountain, and they don't have no reggae in Hawaii because after Bob Marley performed, they banned reggae because all the Hawaiians bought all that weed and the Hawaiians wanted to quit the Mormon church because when the Hawaiians seen Bob Marley, the Mormons was teaching that the black man can't go to heaven. And when all these Hawaiians and Samoans seen by Marley, they quit the Mormon church because they said the Mormons was lying because they know by Marley going to heaven. So when I'm there walking around, everywhere you go in Hawaii, they drive past me. They saying, by Marley, by Marley, hollering at me. Anywhere you go, they hollering by Marley when they see us. So I take my woman and my boy to the north side, to Tony Dredd's house, and there's a white dude there with Tony Dredd say, he want to bring the first reggae band to Hawaii since Bob Marley. Tell me this ain't the most high. I can't do this. So I say, I just ran into the leader of the Rastafari, my boy in town. So Tom Mountain said, can you get him to hook up with me to do the show? And bingo. I go to the hotel room, tell Holly my scale. He hooks up with Tom Mountain, and it's the first reggae show in years, because Bob Marley had been dead. It was the first reggae show in Hawaiian history was the Rastafarians through the most high having me get to the airport. What's the odds? that I'm going to pick them up at the airport at the same time and even see the brother. That's why you can't, I can't take credit for none of this because I can't do none of this. So the Rastafarians come, do two shows, do a show on, on Oahu, do a show on, on Maui. After the Rastafarians do their show, the Hawaiians stopped calling us uh, by Mali and started calling us Rasta because of the Rastafarians. So they learned Rasta, or they Rasta. So they stopped calling us by Mali. They started calling us Rasta because the Rastafarians came. After that, Peter Tosh came. And when Peter Tosh came, I went to the concert and ran into... Jason, what up, Jason? Where the hell you at? Crazy as hell. And Jason took us to the hotel room, and I gave Peter Tosh a bunch of buttons like this. I should have told him about Kojo, but, you know, we in name drop. I gave him a bunch of buttons like this, and I gave Peter Tosh some Peter Tosh buttons, because right? I used to make everybody buttons. Back then, you can only get a Holly Selassie button you might get a Marcus Garvey button. 
I don't think nobody had no Bob Marley buttons, but I had Bob Marley buttons and I had Peter Tosh buttons. <laughs> so I gave Peter Tosh a, some Peter Tosh buttons. I'll never forget it. He looked at it. He looked at me. And he said, boy, he was a pirate. <laughs> he called me a pirate. But he was flattered because nobody else cared about him. Nobody else was promoting him. I was promoting them big time. And that was a big concert because it was rain clouds all over the stadium. And it was drizzling. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Tosh. When Peter Tosh came up, the clouds opened up and the sun came out. Same thing happened here in Chicago when I seen Santana. All them rock bands played, it was raining. But when Santana started playing, it stopped raining and the clouds opened and the sun came out. Same thing happened with Peter Tosh. So all of these things was blessing, and all of this how I knew that Rastafari was who, who they say Rastafari is. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. When his majesty was coronated, they gave him everything, say, Lion of Judah. The Israelis gave him all the artifacts back. His Majesty, when Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, His Majesty went to the League of Nations to plead with the European nations and the League of Nations to stop this aggression of a military that got tanks, right? And all of these things, right? So the Europeans was asked to stop the Italians because the Africans only had spears and horses and some little rifles, but Italy had tanks and jets and all that. It was the first time in history that the African people went to war with modern weapons. So when His Majesty went to the League of Nations, they booed him, boo. I seen the video and I said, wow, they always teach us in school not to boo, but here's the leaders of the world booing a black man, right? So his majesty say, you light the fire in Ethiopia, but it shall burn Europe. And the next thing you know, Hitler was blowing up London, blowing up Poland, killing them, and invading, right, invading Russia. So next thing you know, Hitler was doing just what High Selassie prophesied. You light the fire in Africa, but it shall burn Europe. And sure enough, Hitler, Italy came into Ethiopia, but Hitler ended up tearing up Europe. Not only did Mussolini come into Ethiopia, when Mussolini came in Ethiopia, with all them weapons. And his majesty left and went to England and what they call exile. Mother Nature killed the Italians. That's the real reason they lost the war. Because the earth turned on them. They started getting bit by mosquitoes, all types of bugs. They started getting malaria, typhoid, everything. They died by the millions. That's why the Italians beat Mussolini and ripped his skin off of him because all the day men and boys and relatives died from the environment, not even from the war. So when the war was over and His Majesty stood supreme, they dismantled the League of Nations and set up the United Nations. And when they set up the United Nations, they invited this black king of kings. They had His Majesty come, and 72 nations walked up to His Majesty, got on their knee, kissed His hand, and asked for His forgiveness. 72 nations got on their knee for a black king. And the United Nations was set up because of Haile Selassie, because of the disrespect in the League of Nations, and because of the prophecy of Haile Selassie, that you start to fire in Africa, but it shall burn Europe. And Europe 
Hitler almost blew England off the map. They was in bonkers. All of this is prophecy. All this is historical facts. And 72 nations kissed a black man's hand and asked for forgiveness, right? You understand? 72 nations got on their knees and say, forgive us. So at that time, Haile Selassie was looked at as the greatest man in the world. If you go Google his pictures, you'll see him with every head of state in the world. Now, when he went to the League of Nations, guess whose room was the opposite of his room? Hitler. So now people say, well, how can I say that High Selassie was divinity, represents divinity? Well, you can always judge a man based on his opposition. Because only a equal or better is going to come at a time to deal with you. So if you look at Stalin and Lenin and Hitler and Mussolini, and if you wanted to say that anybody would be an embodiment of the devil, you would have to say it was Hitler. So who would be there? What black man would be in power at the time of the devil? You tell me. Not only that, it was his majesty that worked with the crewmen and them to form the Organization of African Unity, which both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X was highly uh, motivated and inspired by his majesty. That's why Malcolm called it the Organization of African American Unity. He got that from Emperor Haile Selassie and a young Mandela. Emperor Haile Selassie gave a pistol to the young Mandela before the young Mandela went to prison. All of them, Sakara, Nkrumah, Ture, Idi Amin, all of them, their hero was Emperor Haile Selassie because Emperor Haile Selassie was looked at as the king of kings and the great man to stand against Italy. Mussolini said that Haile Selassie was dead four times, and he wasn't. And Haile Selassie came out and said, we don't have to have this war. In so many words, he said, we don't have to have this war. Mussolini, get your sword, and I get my sword, and we can just fight, and then whoever wins is over. And Mussolini did not take that challenge because Haile Selassie was very was only five foot two, but he was miraculous. That's why we say Rastafari, because as a young Ras, before he was High Selassie, the people in Ethiopia used to scream Rastafari because he could ride a horse better than everybody, he could fight better than everybody, he could do a lot as a little person. And a lot of scriptures, uh, chapter five, verse two, refer to him. Now, I know a lot of stories about Ali Selassie. There's a cab driver that drive there in Chicago that fought with the Italians. And the cab driver said he was on a, in a mountain where it was slopes and there was a waterfall. And he says that Ali Selassie was on this side of the waterfall and that he seen him and that he was a marksman. And he said he shot Haile Selassie right in the heart, right in the chest, death shot. He said when he hit Haile Selassie, he said Haile Selassie went under the waterfall. Then he said he seen him look like he turned to two or three different people. Then he came back out with no shot. 
there's a brethren called Rasta Man from Zion. Follow him on Instagram. That's my brethren. His name is Isaac. Isaac made this for me. Isaac was raised by Emperor Haile Selassie. Isaac wrote this for me. This say Ramesses, the son of the sun. So this is this is written in Amharic with my name and what my name means. And Isaac mother died. And his father was real close to Haile Selassie and didn't have nobody to help him with the kids. So Isaac spent a lot of time in the palace with his majesty. And Isaac is like a holy man himself. He's an Ethiopian brother, uh, a musician. He's very popular because he was raised by the emperor. And Isaac used to tell us all the things he's seen the emperor do that his majesty wouldn't eat no more than the amount of food he can hold in his hand. I've read books on his majesty where they have fasts in Ethiopia, a lot of fasts. And as a young child, his majesty would go from one fast, and when everybody else come out to fast, he'd stay on until the next fast. He wouldn't eat all the meat. You know, they ate a lot of goat and stuff. He wouldn't eat all that. And mentally loved him so much because Ross McConnell won the first war against Italy. And that Ross McConnell and Menelik was like this, and Menelik didn't have no sons. So High Selassie was like a son to him. That's why we say Earth Rifle Ruler, because he was supposed to get the throne, not Menelik's daughter. His majesty was supposed to get the throne. Because if they wouldn't have killed, which they did, Ross McConnell, the next emperor was going to be Ross McConnell. It wasn't going to be the D2 or none of them. The next emperor was going to be Ross McConnell after Menelik, no doubt. Anybody that say no don't know their history. Haile Selassie's father was going to be the next emperor because he saved Ethiopia. He the one who won them wars, not mentally. And so I would advise black people to study uh, what they don't want you to know. They don't want our children to know. Now, I'm going to tell you the biggest reason they don't want black people to acknowledge how he's lost. And the biggest reason is because there's a lot of people in Ethiopia that's the descendant of Solomon. The descendancy goes and splits into a lot of families. I need to put the video in the link down here where you can go watch all the families that come down from the Solomonic legend. The Solomonic legend is that when Sheba went to see Solomon, Solomon wanted to have sex with her. She said, no. He said, okay, fine, as long as you don't drink none of my water. He put extra hot stuff in her food. She wanted some water. They had sex. She went back to Ethiopia. She had Menelik. Menelik, not the Menelik, that Menelik, the original Menelik. Menelik was blessed by the Most High to transfer the covenant of Israel to Africa because Saul, David, and Solomon had lost their way. They had all became corrupt. Solomon was worshiping all kinds of weird gods. Solomon had become a sexual pervert. Solomon, when he died, he couldn't even lay in bed unless he had two or three women in the bed because he couldn't keep his body heat. He was worshiping all kinds of strange gods. David had his best friend killed so he could marry his wife. And you know Saul was crazy, you know. So they all, the covenant was taken. Menelik went and stole the Ark of the Covenant and took it to Ethiopia. Israel started chasing them to get it. And when Israel got to Egypt, they asked the black Egyptians, have you seen somebody come through here with the ark? And they said, we seen a man on a magic carpet and he went by so fast that all the palm trees and Kemet leaned to the side. 
Now that might sound way out to you, but Solomon was a master at magic carpets and all of that. Well, I have to do a whole video on that. Solomon was a master, what you would call magician or cosmic spaceman. He was way out there. So it's not beneath uh, um, mentally to inherit the holiness of his father. When he took the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia, then they made a bunch of copies so you don't know where it's at. Now, why? It's because when Christ walked the earth, Christ taught 12 people the teachings of, not what they teach in Christianity, Christ taught how to heal, how to walk on water, how to use your God side of your brain. If you read about Christ, he ain't teaching them no religious stuff. He was teaching them how to raise people from the dead and walk on water. Go read it. So Christ was teaching them all of this stuff. And once they learned it, they were supposed to go around the world and teach everybody else. Well, the first people they taught was this Ethiopian. The first person outside the 12 disciples that learned anything was this Ethiopian. And this Ethiopian took the teachings back to Ethiopia and Candake declared that whole part of Ethiopia to be up under the teachings of Christ. So this is how Ethiopia became the oldest Christian nation on earth, true Christianity, which is the art of learning how to use your God side of the brain because we're half Adam and Eve and half Lord gods when the sons of God found that the daughters of men was fair and came unto them and giants walked the earth. So we're that descendant because that's what Noah was. Noah was a descendant from the sons of God that found that the daughters of men was fair. Read Genesis, you'll see all that. So we are half God, half man. So that's why they said Christ was blasphemous because he said, ye are all gods and children of the Most High. But people think children is just, no, really children. The Most High is your grandfather. The Lord God is your father. And Eve's descendants is your mother. So it was natural that this would go to Ethiopia. It's only natural. Now, people say, what that got to do with Kemet? Kemet is the son of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the mother of all Africa. And Ethiopia is the mother of Kemet. Kemet was like downtown. Kemet was like, let me take two places. Kemet was like Washington, D.C. And Ethiopia was like Rome. So one of them was the religious headquarters, a place of consciousness and righteousness, and the other was where we took care of business. Kemet was the Valley of the Kings, where kings would retire and move to Kemet and let their sons run the country, and so the daddy would become like what we call senators and governors. That's where they got it from. So if I run a country, once I get a certain old, like my youngest son, I'm 62, and maybe in about 10 years, I beat and prime my son, he would become the, the king of that, and I would be like a governor, and I would move to the Valley of the Kings, and then they would coordinate with me through messengers in Kemet what's going on where I came from, and through Kemet, I could get help through other kings in the Valley of the King to send help. So it was a headquarters where you could get help and get information to all over Africa. Kemet was the original Washington, D.C. That's why Washington, D.C. got the obelisk and all that. And, and uh, Ethiopia is the mother of Kemet, and that's why Benjamin Banneker and all them, that's why the traffic light is this colors, a black light with red, gold, and green, because our ancestors left us signals Look at the traffic light. It'll show you who made it. The traffic light is red, gold, and green. 
You know what I mean? You understand? You feel what I'm saying? So the traffic light is red, gold, and gray. So this is where the knowledge is and the knowledge transfer. If you don't uphold the knowledge, the knowledge will transfer. The same way that if they didn't up, keep uphold the knowledge in Jamaica, it's going to put me in a position where it's going to come up here because you've got to uphold the knowledge and you've got to represent the knowledge. And if you start getting shaky, it'll transfer to another place. And it transferred from Israel to Ethiopia. And how it got, and how it became fundamental in Ethiopia is because the stories of Israel and Christ is a story of the invasions of Europeans to come down and conquer the blacks in the South. And if you look at Europe up here, if you want to come down and you got to conquer Africa, right? You got to pass where? The blacks that live north of Africa. So the stories of Christ are the stories of the Romans on their way to invade Africa. As the Romans come and run into contact with these Hebrews up here, they get to fighting. This is after Christ. They don't tell you this. After Christ, they get to fighting, fighting to maintain. They pushing the Hebrews down. The black Egyptians and the Cushites and the Ethiopians join them. They all start fighting against the Romans and the Philistines and them that had an army trying to conquer us, and they pushed us, pushed us, and we all ended up in Ethiopia. That's why Ethiopia is Islamic, Jude, Judaic and Christian because it represents the law, last stronghold where all the blacks united to fight. They don't want to tell you that so they keep you religiously divided. But it, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a piece missing. And it's in the Maccabee. And if you read the book of the Maccabee, you will see that the black Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and the Hebrews all fought together against the Europeans. We are not enemies. We all was fighting them. And when they, that's how the Hebrews ended up in Ethiopia. It's black Hebrews that set up Judaism in Ethiopia. That's a historical fact, but the whites are saying it was them. No, those was black people that went there and built all them Judaic temples and stuff there. Hebrew Israelites, black Hebrew Israelites lived in, e in Ethiopia and black Muslims and black Christians lived in Ethiopia and black Egyptians lived there because they all looked alike. That's why when Mary had to go hide with the baby, how can she hide in Egypt if they don't look alike? How can Mary go hide in Egypt if Hebrews and Egyptians don't look alike? Then they could have came down there and said, they go right there. He don't look like them. They had to look alike for her to take the baby and hide. And there's stories about the Muslims that ran there. Muslims ran, black Muslims ran to Ethiopia, okay? Mohammed's grandfather was an Ethiopian Coptic. Facts. The Prophet Mohammed's grandfather was a black Ethiopian Coptic. The Coptic church comes out of Kemet. It was the place where they practice an extension of what they learn in Ethiopia. That's why an, a black Egyptian crowned his majesty. We all connected. There is no division. And when they came down to fight us and kept fighting us, blacks started going what? 
West. So the West Africans come from East Africa. Go watch the mother queen of Ghana tell you exactly where the Ghanaians, the Senegalese, the Nigerians, Ashanti, and all them came from. They came from Kenya. They came from East Africa. It's a black queen mother, Ghanaian queen, tells the whole story that they came from East Africa. Or to, I got it on my video called West Africans Come from East Africa. I copied it and changed the name. Just, just searching YouTube, West Africans Come from East Africa, and let a, a West African tell yourself. That's how the Dogons got over there. The Dogons come from Kimi. And the Kemetic and all y'all come from somewhere else. We'll get into that later. So this is why I don't have nothing but respect for Emperor Haile Selassie because I'm a pharaoh. And just like real recognize real, shoot, pharaohs recognize pharaohs. So he's the pharaoh of pharaohs. <laughs> no doubt. He's the pharaoh of pharaohs and hidden from black people. And I think black people need to hold this man up and teach our little black sons that a black man was the king of kings to give our youth some pride. When Haile Selassie came to Chicago, which is like in the top three headquarters for black people around the world, okay? Chicago is like a headquarters for black people, period. Ain't no doubt. It's the reason Elijah was here. It's the reason Noble Drew Ali was here. It's the reason Farrakhan is here. It's the reason Obama was here. It's the reason all that's here. We are like our headquarters. And when His Majesty came to Chicago with Ebony and Jet Magazine, he said, I am not just the king of Africa. I am the king of black people all over the world. And his majesty put money aside and gave us land in Shashamani. Now, let me tell you something really deep. Sun Ra, my guru, told me that African kings from way back have put billions and billions and trillions of dollars in the World Bank for us to return to Egypt. And he said, but they don't, they know we don't know the money's in there. Sunrise said that there's trillions of dollars that kings have been putting in the bank for black people to come back and that the World Bank don't want to tell us. And when Sunrise went to Kemet, they told him that 85% of the black people in the United States come from Kemet. And when Sun Ra went to Mexico, the Mexican embassy told him the same thing. Real talk. So understand your divinity and stop arguing over these little religious things because that ain't, we are connected whether you like it or not. Abraham slept with a comedic woman and had Ishmael, who is the father of Islam. So there's a connection. Moses married an Ethiopian. There's the connection. You can't erase that connection. There is no division. We are one. And we are being brainwashed to think it's other people when it's us, and then when we find out it's us, we're being brainwashed to hate each other. Let me give you a perfect example. The sons of Israel got jealous of Joseph and put Joseph in the hole. They found Joseph, a black man, took him to Egypt and sold his black man to these black men, right? Pete Gang. When they sold this black man to this other black man, he was cool. He had a high position 
because the Pharaoh's wife said Joseph tried to sleep with her, but how could Joseph try to sleep with her if Joseph wasn't already in the palace? So Joseph was already a boss. They put Joseph in the dungeon. The Pharaoh started having dreams that he couldn't figure out. Let me show you, Joseph was a boss. If the Pharaoh had dreams, couldn't figure out, why did the people tell Pharaoh, Joseph could figure it out? That means the people was going down there in the jail fucking with Joseph. They were still listening to Joseph. The Pharaoh being so cool, he said, go bring Joseph. Peep gang. So the black man, Joseph, the black Hebrew comes to the black comedic brother. And the black comedic brother said, I'm having these dreams, bro. What do it mean? Joseph said, this mean it's going to be a phantom, bro. Save up all the food because it's going to be a famine, right? The black Egyptian, the black comedic brother say, bet, Joseph. And he puts Joseph in a high position again, like, pres like vice president, and they save all this food, right? Now, a famine do come, and the whole world is starving. The Bible only tell you that the Joseph's brother came looking for food, and Joseph said, where your daddy at? Go get your daddy. When they went and got their daddy and come back, he said, daddy, this me. The black Pharaoh gave the black Hebrews the best land in Kemet, the land of Ramesses. What number loved that? But what they're not telling you is everybody was coming to Kemet to get food because the drought was all over the world. Therefore, a black Hebrew and a black comedic brother saved the world from starving to death. Two of the greatest men that ever lived was Joseph and that Pharaoh. They basically saved the world. Tell me I'm wrong. Basically, by working together and by the Pharaoh honoring and believing what Joseph said, and by Joseph not having no grudge and telling the man the truth. Basically, they saved the Hebrews. The Hebrews would have died because they came there to get the food. But if them brothers wouldn't have worked together, wouldn't have been no food. Tell me I'm lying. So when it say now a new Pharaoh came that knew not Joseph, that's a whole different person. That ain't necessarily, that ain't necessarily a black man. That's them invaders coming down because any other black Egyptian would have knew Joseph. So it got to be somebody was calling themselves a pharaoh that all of a sudden didn't like them. It couldn't have been a black man because all the black man would have knew him already. So this got to be when them foreigners was coming down calling themselves pharaohs and stuff. Y'all know the history. All them funny style Europeans just call themselves pharaohs. They hicks us in them. Because a, a black man, if I honored them, my grandson will know them. So you can't say my grandson or my great-grandson don't know Joseph. Yeah, he would know him. They would have been family. So for somebody to not know him, had to be somebody that really wasn't an Egyptian, was an invader calling themselves an Egyptian. Straight like that. So that's what all this knowledge done for me. Princes shall come out of Kemet. Ethiopia shall soon stretch forth their hands unto the Most High. What we got to do is we got to unite Ethiopia, Kemet, and Israel. And there's a Bible verse where the Most High say he loved all three of them. There's a Bible verse. I wish I knew it off the top of my head. There's a Bible verse that say the Most High love all three of them, Israel, Ethiopia, and Kemet. It's a verse. I wish I knew what it was. Anybody know it? Type it. I wish I was on my computer. I could search it on my phone. It's a deep verse. And the Most High, big up all three of them. Now, why we don't read that? Now, let me tell you something powerful. When the roster man got the reggae going on here in Chicago 
and reggae was big. Don't you know everybody used to be there? My Hebrew brethren that I love like family as soul vegetarian under Ben Ami Ben Israel. They vegans, they've been in Chicago feeding black people vegan food for 40 years, right? They've been feeding us good. Hebrew brothers. They've been feeding black Muslims and Rastas and everybody and regular black people and Christians for years. And back in the day, I used to go in there to get something to eat, and they'd be like, what's up, brother? You going to be at the reggae spot tonight? Everybody used to be at the reggae spot. Orthodox Muslims, Nation of Islam, Hebrew Israelites, regular blacks, gang members, everybody would be at the reggae. The roster man has never been an opposition to nobody. Yep, that's it. That's it, Isaiah 43, 3. For I, the Lord, thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba. No, it's another one. Now, it's another one. It's another one. It's another one. It's another one. Now, there's another one where he say he love all of them, like to this my children, to this my people, and to this something. He called them all something great. It's another verse. There's another verse that's deeper than that, where he, where he big them all up. Yeah, there's another verse. If somebody find it, post it, because that need to be on here. There's another verse where he mentioned Israel, Egypt, and Ethiopia. He mentioned all three of them. It's very interesting. Very interesting. And he like, and so-and-so that I love, he named them all in a way. It was all named in a way of love and respect. It's crazy. Nobody read that verse. I got to put that shit on a T-shirt. Now that I think about it, that should be the bomb. So look it up. So for me, as a young black man in America, you know, how he's lasting me, everything to me. You know what I'm saying? You know, it was a major part of my revolutionary thinking, a major part of my thinking when you think in religious terms, the major part when you think of prophetic terms. And most of all, I ain't like the way our kids wasn't taught that a black man was the king of kings. And I'll tell you something else too. Back in the day with his majesty, why all them white people was running up there to take his pictures? And why did they lighten up his pictures like that? If you look at his pictures, his majesty is every shade under the sun. And there's pictures with him with nappy hair, dark, but you can see his pictures. They docked it, all his pictures, to make him look like a white man. And that is a fact. Look at this man, don't look nothing like no white man. And they got pictures with him, brown, brown. But they got these other pictures. You can see they was doctored and early photoshopped or whatever. And they tried to lighten his skin as much as they possibly could. It's clear. All you got to do is look at all his pictures. And when I try to find dark skin pictures of him, it's like pulling teeth. But I saved all the ones because they played with his skin color. Because I used to be like, why is man so many different shades? What's up with this? Why this man a hundred different shades? Like my friend Isaac. Man, he dark. But they don't like to show dark Ethiopians or dark Egyptians. Right? And if you look at Ice Lassie picture, he ain't never the same color. And I used to always ask myself, well, if he ain't nothing, why was these white people running there in the 30s taking all these pictures? Why are they running in the 20s and the 30s taking pictures of somebody that ain't nothing? What did they know? This man got more pictures than a rapper. Ain't nobody got that many pictures from that time period. Why they all ran to the coronation? What did they know? 
Nobody got that many pitches. I'm telling you. His Majesty got pitches that you could search and find pitches. I got a folder. It got so many pitches. You wouldn't believe it. You got to search all night for them pitches. You got to search all day and night for days to find all the pitches. And you're going to see pitches with every head of state there was. Even Kennedy and all them. My mother had a bunch of old newspapers. When she passed away and stuff, I was taking care of my father. I said, let me clean out this closet. And I'm cleaning out all these newspapers. And I got a newspaper with Ice Lice in it. I got a newspaper of John F. Kennedy when he was killed and the funeral. And I got His Majesty at the procession in a newspaper. And I used to have the National Geographic that's where I got this picture from. I had the National Geographic with this picture. When I left L.A., a lot of my stuff got lost. I had the original National Geographic with these pictures in it, with the coordination and everything. I got to try to find that again. Probably almost impossible. It's a lot they don't want to tell you. It's a lot people don't want to deal with. A lot of people don't like the fact that the covenant went to Ethiopia, see? And people that want to deal with Israel all the time don't want to face the fact the covenant went to Ethiopia and don't like to deal with the fact how Solomon and David and Saul dropped the ball. They had no more righteousness no more. They had became corrupt. It only makes sense that the covenant, there's nobody you mentioned after them. After them, Israel done. After David, Saul, and Solomon, who is it? Nobody. Even to the point where Christ had to run to Africa from, because Israel ain't nothing but right across north of Africa. And I'll tell you something else. The only reason that Israel is not Africa and the only reason Africa is a continent is that Africa is a man-made continent. Hello? Listen, Israel is connected to Africa. The only reason Africa is a continent, Africa is a man-made continent, because if you take away the Suez Canal, Africa is not surrounded by water. Facts. Take away the Suez Canal, and Africa is not a continent. Which means it's connected to Israel, which means them black people, we all the same. Just because this is Africa don't mean black people going to stay there. They're going to live north. So the people calling themselves, all this Hamite, Shemite nonsense is crazy. It's all make-believe. Because Ham wasn't ever cursed anyway. Ham never got cursed. All these years, they had me think, no, Rasta do not believe Selassie is Jesus Christ. Go back and study. Rastas do not believe Selassie is Jesus Christ. Where you get that from? See, you don't know nothing, and you're speaking on something you don't know. Uh, uh, Rastas don't say Selassie is Jesus Christ. See? Sorry, you got to go. Go back and study. Go back and study. <laughs> Rastas don't teach high Selassie is Jesus Christ. Where you get that from? Yeah, you got to go back and study. The reason he say that, because he trying to say that Christ is the king of kings. Christ is not the king of kings. Christ is the prince of peace. Christ ain't the king of kings. You understand? We don't burn. Well, Jesus is not the name. We respect Christ. 
but we don't, uh, Jesus was not his name, but we respect Christ, but we never looked at Christ as the king of kings. Christ is the peace, prince of peace. Melchizedek is the king of peace. And Christ is, and, and Isolas is the king of kings. Christ is not the king of kings. Christ is the, is the prince of peace, and Christ is the lamb of God. So you got to go back and study. The fact is, when they asked Haile Selassie, what do you think about Rasta saying you God? Haile Selassie said, who am I to question their faith? <laughs> who am I to tell them they wrong? That's what Haile Selassie said. They said, what do you think about Rasta's calling you God? He said, who am I to tell them they wrong? Now you read between the lines. That's exactly what he said. Right, his majesty, the lion, and Christ is the lamb of God. And Christ is the most respected of all the holies because Christ the only one could take shit. That's why his majesty and everybody respect Christ. Christ is the most respected of all the gods, all the angels and everything because everybody want to know how you take so much shit. That's why he called him the lamb of God because ain't nobody else that had them kind of powers would take that shit. Everybody else would have fucked some shit up. I couldn't have did it. If I had powers like Christ, I would have struck Pontius Pilate with lightning. Everybody would have got hit by lightning. Blah, blah, blah. You never would have crucified me. See me? So, no, the reason Christ is held up high by all of us, because we don't want to know how you take that much shit. Michael can't do it. Raphael wouldn't do it. Gabriel wouldn't do it. Moses wouldn't do it. Nobody would, would with that much power would take that shit like that. Nobody would die and then come back. Say, man, they can't do nothing to me. Go ahead and kill me and come back. That was some gangster shit. Well, nothing more gangster than that. To die, and then they say, ah, oh, he dead. They say, nah, he out, and he moving around somewhere and spook everybody. You understand? So people trying to teach, hey, Christ. No, you got to study. But that's Christians, they teach the Father and the Son is the same, but they not. Get the facts straight. So people don't know what they be talking about. No. Christ is the Lamb and the one that can take the most shit. Ain't nobody fucking with Christ, because can't nobody take that much shit. That's why Christ is amazing. <laughs> it's like, how did you do that? With all that he could have did, he could have did a lot of stuff. Ain't none of y'all would have took that if y'all could have struck somebody in the face with lightning or made people just die. You wouldn't have took that. You got to be pretty powerful to take all that, knowing you could do something about it, especially feeling pain and all that. So Christ don't even count. People don't even know what Christ is or what that's all about. That's a whole different story. That's something else. We don't even want to get into that. That ain't even close to the same story. Not even close. So that's not even nowhere close to nowhere in the same realm of anything of that man being born of a virgin and allowing himself to feel pain and sexual urges and all that. That's a whole nother, whole nother thing. People don't even understand what that was all about. You understand? So there's people like that person. That's why I sound like to talk about this kind of stuff because you got weirdos caught up in their religion. They want to have religion argument. Like don't nobody want to argue with you. Whatever your belief is, Go on your own page and say your own belief. That's why these religions are so evil because they go out of their way to try to 
to try to put their religion over somebody else's ideology, which ain't necessary. Whatever you believe, go believe it. It's not necessary to challenge other people. But these people are so crazy, they want to challenge somebody else. I'm not going to go on no Christian page and challenge them or no Muslim page and challenge them or no Hebrew ch page and challenge what they said. Like, that, how is that righteous? When you want to talk about righteousness, how is it righteousness to get all out your body and go into somebody else's space and intrude with your ideology in somebody else's space? Nothing's righteous about that. Nothing's humble about that. Nothing's righteous about that. That's basically wickedness. Nobody do that but Satan. No, nothing holy going to do that. Whatever God you believe in, show me that God coming down here correcting people. Show me God going to any temple saying, no, no, I didn't tell y'all that. Show me God actually doing that. Show me God actually telling people their religious ideas wrong. Show me that in real life. According to all y'all religions, God is chilling. <laughs> Wait, no judgment day. According to what you teach, God is somewhere chilling. God is not going around telling people, don't believe this, don't believe that. Believe this. Crazy shit. That's why I ain't going to have no comments over here because I ain't got time for no nut weirdos, a lot of people that's not firm in they, that's, that, that goes against you is because they're not firm in their own beliefs. When you firm in your own ideology, you don't find yourself having to go and deal with other people. That's why so many Moors are so irritating and so disrespectful and such a bunch of losers. Because is it really necessary to troll everybody that say they black to tell a nigga they not black. You know what I'm saying? Like, what kind of low life is you? Whatever your belief is, stand on it on your own. If it's not enough for it to make you happy, then your shit is bullshit. If you know you a moor, why ain't you happy? Why I got to say I'm one? Bitch, I'm me. I'm not a moor. And ain't going to never be one. So now what you going to do? But I ain't going to tell you you not one. I can't see myself going to a moor and saying, you ain't a moor, you black. Who does that? If the brother say he a moor, he a moor. If the brother say he black, he black. If a brother say a Hebrew, he Hebrew. He say a Rossi, he Rossi. He say a Kometi, he Kometi. Who are you? to go tell somebody they not what they say they are, whatever they are. So that's why I don't really burn Jesus. If they say they love Jesus, that ain't for me to burn them. Because when I'm burning them, they burning me. And I'm not into that. Stand on your own. There's no reason to disrespect people for whatever they believe. Because a person that said they believe, because one day I got up and somebody had stole my catalytic converter on my car. It was Sunday morning. And I said, didn't know church people do it. So I'll take the church people over the catalytic converter stealers. These gangbangers, they don't go to church just killing black people. So why are you trying to make the church people at the bottom? They not at the bottom. Them church people... Don't bother nobody like that. It's not known of black church people that's really into the church going around doing messed up stuff in the community. That's not really known. Most of our problem with people, they ain't got no religion at all. Go into jail. Them brothers ain't no religious people. Them brothers is all heathens. Brothers get in trouble and then try to turn Muslims. But when they get arrested, they don't be Muslims, they don't be Christian, they don't be nothing. They just be troublemakers. 
I don't even want to hear fake stuff. Like, I'm real. I've been inside the jail. I've been in the county jail for four months. I was innocent, but I was in there for four months. I've been in real. I'm really on the streets. And, and all them brothers, none of them is Christian, but a handful of them that made some mistakes. All the, and some of them is fake, trying to be Christian, thinking they can fool God to beat their case. But most of them brothers don't talk a religious word out their mouth. Most of them GDs, BDs, and them, they never say one religious thing. <laughs> Please, give me a break. Spend your energy trying to get people to be righteous instead of arguing with somebody else that's doing a different form of righteousness. Why would I go argue with a Jehovah Witness or somebody like that when I got real knuckleheads out here? You understand? For me, it's not about necessarily putting nobody down. It's about building up yourself. Every energy you spend born this and born that and born that, that's three bonds. That could have been three build this and build this and build that. So you born it or you build it. Because if you build it, you ain't got to burn nothing. But see, we own that crazy stuff. Like, the more they burnt the gays, the more gays they got. Look how many gays they burnt in Jamaica. And listen, Jamaica flaming gay now. So did they burn them? No. They flourished. No, that ain't the verse either. It's another verse. Now, it's another verse. I'll find it. I'll find it. It's another verse, Mikhail. I'll find it. I'll put it up one day. Now, it's another verse. So, you know, all that stuff, you know, all that stuff is the reason we got so many. No, he wasn't supposed to be timed out. My bad, Mikhail. I wasn't trying to time you out. What'd I do? Uh, I messed up, Mikhail. Why is he timed out? I wasn't trying to tire you out. What the hell did I do? I was trying to remove it. Yeah, it's supposed to be Master Lee. You ain't supposed to be tired out. Man, this thing crazy. Hey, Mikhail, I wasn't trying to tire you out. I don't know what the heck. Crazy. I was trying to delete it till we get the right one. So anyway, that, that's what's going on with that. So, you know, everybody got to be positive. You know, be positive, do your own thing. Try to unite everything instead of, like, divide everything. And, you know, us as black people, we got to unite. We can't listen to people that's not black coming around black with their religious ideas because all of that European, that American Christianity stuff from a country that had slaves and all that, that ain't real. Because if you was that holy, you wouldn't be known for all this racism and all this slavery and all that. So miss us with all that America holy Christian stuff. Miss us. That's not real. These police that's shooting us going to church on Sunday. The Ku Klux Klan is a religious organization. Ku Klux Klan is a Christian organization. Burning crosses on people's land. So... We ain't buying all that. Not to mention Jesus is white. Christ, white Christianity is racist as hell. It's not a black person nowhere in their religion. Not to, that, how racist can you get to even include God into your racism? It's crazy. So black people, y'all got to get away from day mentality about these things. And they create all this division. They interpreted the stories to make you be enemies of each other. That's based on their interpretation. That's not based on a black interpretation. I see Hebrews all the time take a white interpretation of the Bible and talk, to, talk about Hamite, Shemite, and all that. And all the time I went to a Christian church, they kept saying, Noah cursed Ham, Noah cursed Ham. No, he didn't. Noah cursed Canaan. If, if I'm black, and I got three black sons. 
and I curse one of them, is black people cursed? Because the other two black? Crazy. If I'm black, I got three black sons. I tell one of them, you ain't going to be shit. That applied to me and the other two sons? No. And we are black. So all of them was black. All ham sons was black. One of them got cursed. The others are still black. So how you going to say black people got cursed or Hamites got cursed when the other two are Hamites and they didn't get cursed? So Hebrews Go and study your scripture for real. The fact is, Canaan got cursed, not Hamites. And Canaan is just one. Crazy. I couldn't believe when I read it for myself and I seen Ham didn't get cursed because they taught me in the Christian school Ham got cursed. So people talking about Hamites, Hamites. No, those are Canaanites. If they're the descendants of Canaan, they're Canaanites. They're not Hamites. So why Shemites against Hamites when only Canaanites is the one was cursed? The rest of the Hamites wasn't cursed. What the hell's going on? Does anybody read it without any type of... And then they're not even cursed because when they say he cursed them, that just means he said, boy, you ain't going to be shit. That don't mean that God honored the curse. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says that when Ham cursed it, when Noah cursed Ham's son, there's nowhere in the Bible that says God honored the curse. Show me where God said, okay, I stamp it. No, you can't show me what God honored. It's just like my daddy. If that's the case, I'm cursed. Because my daddy said all the time, boy, you ain't going to be shit. No, he cursed me out, but he didn't curse me because God ain't going to honor him saying that. Come on. Come on. When they say he cursed his son, it just meant he went off on the motherfucker. It don't mean that God honored it. It just meant he was talking shit. God damn it, can this motherfucker doing all this? That's what he did. They trying to make it like God honored it. It never say in the Bible that God honored what Noah say. Because Noah was drunk and naked. How is a drunk, naked motherfucker going to curse somebody? Dude, you naked and sloppy, right? You all out of order, naked in front of your kids, right? Noah, naked, drunk, all out of order in front of his kids. How you going to curse somebody? Punk, put your clothes on. <laughs> I read it for myself. Ain't nobody going to honor no drunk, naked nigga curse. Why y'all trying to play God like a fool? Why y'all trying to play God like a fool? Noah was drunk and naked in front of his kids. <laughs> Let's tell that part. Of the, what's up with that part? And they laughed at his goofy ass. Rightfully so. Not because he was necessarily naked, but because he was drunk and naked, which is, which is often funny. Okay? Hello. Which is often hilarious. Hello. I would have laughed at his goofy ass too, probably. Look at daddy, tripping. Drank too much of that shit. <laughs> he gonna get up trying to curse me. Bro, put your clothes on. You know what I'm saying? Get the hell out of here. So all my family's supposed to be cursed because you drunk and naked and it's funny? Yeah, all right. I don't be believing all that old woo shit, man. I don't believe that. I read it for myself. I don't believe all that. I don't believe, I don't let nobody put no interpretations on nothing. That's white people put that on there. So because he said that, you black people are cursed. No, we not. How are we cursed? Because a black man laughed at his father drunk, but white people not cursed, and you had slaves. And was beating people, and was raping people. And you ain't cursed? Get the fuck out of here. 
Tell that shit to somebody else, okay? Please. Don't go kill me and abuse me and tell me you killed me and abused me because I'm cursed. The only thing that's cursed is that I met you. That's the only bad luck I ever had. <laughs> the only bad luck I ever had is bumping into your trifling, broke, no natural resources where you come from ass. Now you want to steal my natural resources and making up all this hocus pocus shit to steal. You know you ain't abusing us for that. You want the gold. You want the cobalt. And you jealous because our land was more blessed than Europe. Tell the truth and shame the devil.